Coming up. The FBI raids dental software researcher who discovered private patient data on a public server. People obsessed with grammar, a.k.a. grammar Nazis, aren't as nice as everybody else, a new study suggests. I could have told you that. The new Doom hides sinister images in its soundtrack. Oh my God, it's backmasking all over again. <laughs> Critics blame parents and the Cincinnati Zoo for Gorilla's death. Mm. Jeremy Irons says Batman vs. Superman deserved bad reviews. Wow. Coke unveiled new patriotic cans for Memorial Day weekend. Captain America Civil War topples Deadpool to become highest grossing film in North America for 2016. Say it ain't so. And more <laughs> on this episode of What's. Hey there, everyone, and thank you for joining us once again. This is the Wide Open Talk Show for Monday, May 30th, 2016, Memorial Day, which is not a day where we should be wishing anyone a happy Memorial Day, but it is a day where we should be all reflective, reflectful, whatever, and think of those that have given their lives in service to our great country. I'm Donovan Adkisson, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host and good friend, Samuel Lewis. Sam, how's your day been? It's been good so far. There's there's an air of anticipation in the air, although we probably won't get around to it until tomorrow. The new Top Gear premieres today. So that's another thing about today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy! In, in tri- this in the more trivial sense of today, right? <laughs> if, you, if you didn't pick up on that, that was a little bit of dripping of sarcasm from me. But anyway... <laughs> yeah. I know you're looking forward to it. I really, I, whatever. <laughs> you know, I didn't necessarily care for the first one, even though it was okay. But <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a call-in show. And so if you'd like to call in during this live broadcast, which we typically do Monday and Wednesday at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time, the number is 229-518-3525. Um, and hopefully it works, but we'll <laughs> we'll give it a shot. All right, so we're going to start off with our first story, and this one, this one uh, probably could hit home for some of our mutual friends. Um, as far as you know, we've got one friend that uh, kind of he doesn't do this specifically, but mm. he he has found vulnerabilities in systems before, and of course we have another mutual friend who actually uh, works in the, uh, the 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 medical software field, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but we've, uh, you want to go over this one or you want me to go over it? You're the one that actually put it in there. Well, I, I don't know all the deep details of it because I didn't get to really dig like I normally do with these things. Okay. But did, so have you dug deep into this one to I, I just, find out? Stuff? I read the entire article this afternoon, uh, pretty mm-hmm. much. Um, I mean, basically what we got here is we got this guy his name is uh, Schaefer. I'm trying to find what his first name is. Uh, Justin, Justin Schaefer. He's a dental computer technician and software security researcher. He's 36 years of, of age. He's in Texas. And so what he does is like a lot of these researchers do. They, they try to find vulnerabilities in software systems. And, and this one specifically is dealing with patient data. Mm. So, one morning around 6.30 a.m., the doorbell starts ringing incessantly, and (laughs) somebody starts banging on the door. And, of course, you know, you start thinking the worst possible things. Like, for him, it's like he had thought maybe his dad had died or something. Mm. But when he gets to the front door and he opens the door, there's cop cars everywhere, you know, lights flashing, and there's 12 to 15 FBI agents, and they got assault weapons trained on him. Mm. And they, they're telling him, you know, put your hands behind your back and all this kind of stuff. And what it comes down to, after they go through and they seize all of his computers and his devices, he said even his Dentrix magazines, which I guess that is a, a dental magazine. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
He said the only thing they left alone was his wife's phone. Uh, <laughs> they, they took 29 items. Now, the backstory is this, and this wasn't even necessarily connected to this particular thing, but it, it, he's starting to wonder if he's being singled out. He was responsible for exposing the fact that Dentrix Software, which is produced by Henry, Sh- I guess that's Sheen Dental. Probably. That's- <laughs> was misleading customers when it claimed to provide encryption. So in collaboration with databreaches.net, which is a site operated by the person who wrote this article, he exposed the vulnerability and filed an FTC complaint that resulted in Henry Sheen signing a consent order to settle Federal Trade Commission charges. So, I mean, the company got in a little bit of hot water. Mm. So the question is, why was the FBI rating Schaefer and treating him like a dangerous criminal? Now, this article is on the Daily Dot, and they said they were unable to obtain a copy of the probable cause affidavit by the time of the publication, and it even may be under seal. But one agent informed Schaefer that it stemmed from an incident in February when Schaefer discovered another security vulnerability in dental records, this one, a publicly available file transfer protocol, or FTP server, operated by the team behind EagleSoft which is a dental practice management software. Now, EagleSoft is manufactured by Patterson Dental, which is a division of Patterson Companies. And according to Schaefer, he was researching an issue with hard-coded database credentials when a search for a password led him to an anonymous FTP server that allowed anyone access. No password required. So then when he looked at the files on the publicly available server, he saw a directory that actually had patient data in it. So then he took steps to alert Patterson to secure the protected uh, health information. So the FBI wasn't there to give him a pat on the back and say, good job, boy. They were actually there because Patterson is claiming that Schaefer had exceeded authorized access in, in accessing their FTP server, which is illegal under the CFAA. (laughs) <laughs> exceeded authorized access for a publicly ava- uh, <laughs> a publicly accessible yeah. open FTP server. Uh, this kind of sounds very similar to um, the deal with the guy, and they 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 actually uh, talk about him later in this article with the mm. whole AT and T thing. Weave, I think, is his name. Mm. Um. So okay, so we're going to recap here. We just jump down here. He reported that Patterson uh, Dental had left patient data on an unsecure FTP server. Then he called attention to another vulnerability in one post in February, then again in the second post in March. And now, according to an FBI agent, Patterson Dental was allegedly claiming that in accessing their unsecured anonymous FTP server, Schaefer had accessed it without authorization and should be charged criminally under the CFAA. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm. I, yeah. I'm saying no. Now. Exactly. The the CFAA, of course, is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is something that was passed back in like 1986. Yeah. And the sad part about this, other than the fact of all the turmoil and and anxiety and everything that has cost him and his family because he had young children. I mean. It said he actually had a crib very close to the, you know, the door, uh, just three feet from the door, mm. you know, and you got FBI agents pulling down with assault weapons on on your ass. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. But the sad part is, is, you know, we had Aaron Schwartz who took his own life in 2013. So there yeah. was a lot of pressure for the CFAA to be updated. And uh, Cindy Kahn and uh, Marsha Hoffman of the Electronic Frontier Foundation addressed the need to reform the law and to pro- protect researchers from criminal prosecution in certain scenarios. And they wrote, the law needs to protect tinkerers, security researchers, innovators, and people who seek to avoid being tracked and discriminated against. The CFAA not only fails to protect, to protect these people, it allows ambitious prosecutors and unhappy companies to target <laughs> them. <laughs> You don't say. 
So we did have a bill proposed by Senators Ron Wyden, Rand Paul, and Representative Zoe Lofgren, but it failed to pass last year. And so it's been like three years since Schwartz's death and nothing has actually happened. Mm. Um, now, I mentioned this Andrew Weave Arnheimer, who was the notorious hacker troll who became famous for leaking the personal information of AT&T iPad users that he was able to get publicly. I mean, mm. he didn't have to hack anything. He was able to publicly access the server. Of course, he went to jail, but that's since been overturned. So the same the same attorney that uh, uh, represented him has actually reached out to Schaefer and said, yeah, we'll... We want to help you, too. Mm. So, you know, I, I do believe this is a case where a company got caught with its pants down. Yeah. Um, because this apparently this this has been uh, this FTP server has been in service since 2006. And at one point you could call tech support and say, hey, I need access to the server. And they just give you the username and password. And then right. eventually they just opened it up, and made it anonymous that anybody could get, get access to it if they knew where to look. Mm. So, I I hope that the uh, the judge will see something like this and go, "This is complete nonsense." Mm. And and they really really need to start working on doing some changes to the CFA the CFAA um, because I mean think about it. This was written back in a time where we didn't have the internet. There's a yeah. I mean, it made it made sense. For, for you to have something in place to try to penalize people who were doing data breaches because a lot of times you had to get into private point-to-point -point connections with the telecommunications company or you actually had to get physical access to the, the machines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now everything's on the, in the cloud, online, and all this other kind of stuff. And... Uh, a lot of companies just do not do a very good job of protecting the data of their users and, and customers. And so it's advantageous to have researchers like Schaefer actually find these vulnerabilities and report them so that, you know, the companies can do the right thing and, and, and shore up their defenses and plug those holes, not be asses about it and decide <laughs> that they want to go after somebody and put them in jail for doing the right thing. Yeah. So, yeah, this this kind of story really gets my dander up. <laughs> yes, it does. It, it does me too. I just, I, I get tired of stuff like this sometimes. <laughs> uh, all right. So, new study says mm -hmm. that people obsessed with grammar aren't as nice as everybody else. We need a study jingle at this point. I think we cover yeah. enough stories to where we... We do. We definitely need a study jingle. So it's a study that was published in March that suggests what we've long suspected, that people who are obsessed with grammar, a.k.a. grammar Nazis, aren't as nice as the rest of us. So what they did is um, asked 83 participants to read email responses to an ad for a roommate and then evaluate the writer on both social and academic criteria. There were three types of emails shown in the study. Emails without errors, emails with grammatical errors only, and emails with typos only. So in addition to reading the emails, the participants were asked to complete a personality assessment. And according to the research, more agreeable participants, as determined by the results of the Big Five Personality Index, tended to rate grammar errors less harshly than less agreeable participants who show more sensitivity to grammos, <laughs> <laughs> which are, how would you say that? Is that homophonous? Homophonous grammar errors like to, T O slash T O O and its, I T apostrophe S slash I T S. Mm. So the study published in the journal PLOS One, hey, that sounds familiar. We've actually <laughs> covered a story that, that actually mentioned that. Mm. So it speculates that the difference between the two groups may be perhaps because less agreeable people are less tolerant of deviations <laughs> from convention. You think? 
You know, I think we probably could have told you that without a study. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, you could have given us the money, and me and Donovan here would have gladly did a study for you. We but. <laughs> And, and we could have, I think we'd have spent all of maybe about 20 bucks and used the rest of it for cheeseburgers. I mean, <laughs> oh, it goes on to say that more extroverted people were likely to overlook written errors that would cause introverted people to judge the person who makes such errors more negatively. Less mm. agreeable people were more sensitive to grandmas, while more conscientious and less open people were sensitive to typos. So wait a minute. So you're trying to tell me that grammar Nazis are typically introverts. Hmm. I don't. I don't think that tracks. Because I consider myself an introverted personality. I'm. I'm more introverted than I am extroverted. Even though I do a hmm. podcast. But right. point is, I mean, introverts do podcast. I'm. I don't consider myself a, a grammar Nazi. I'm not hmm. that kind of guy. I mean, I'll look at it and go, Well, yeah, they made a mistake. But I'm not going to be the one that points it out right in the forum of social media. Hey, Dumbo, that was supposed to be T-O, not T-O-O, or vice versa. Mm, I or, wish I could find this. There was there was someone that was being a smart aleck. Because I think it was last weekend the official big spelling bee happened, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And someone on social media decided to be a bit of an ass to the thing. you like... You know, we could be doing better things, but blah, 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 you know. And then their only response was a grammar correction in the tweet. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I did see that. Oh, it was beautiful. It really was. Yeah, I think I did see that. Oh, that that reminds me of another another story that we'll get to, or a connection to another story dealing with the gorilla. But mm. there there's a blogger. That uh, I don't follow him per se, but uh, Matt Walsh, the asshole. Um, <laughs> but he made a post today that was talking about how everybody was getting upset over the death of a gorilla. At the same time, there was like 125,000 aborted babies or something like that. And I'm like, that. <laughs> oh, I want to strangle this dude. Not literally, <laughs> just with words. I tightly. don't know what. I'm, I'm going to say this to you publicly. That way people know I've given you this advice before. Why do you follow him? Why don't you just step away? That's, it's like, why do you do this to yourself? Because I, I clicked on follow on his Facebook thing one time, and and I just don't unfollow. I guess, I, I don't know, man. It's I, I guess, you know, I have a dull day. I look at that, and I'm like, hey, now my fire's lit. <laughs> I guess. I don't Oh. Anyway, um, <laughs> to wrap this one up, I like this last line, and this, this of course, is an article on Mashable. Ultimately, though, no matter what your grammatical disposition is, we understand everybody, spelled E-V-R-B-O-D-Y, <laughs> makes a typo, T-P-I, T-P-I-N, T-P-Y-O, once, O-N-S-E, in a while. W I L E. <laughs> yes. Yes. Shout shout out to both MJ Franklin for coming up with that and the editor for allowing it to happen. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Can you imagine as an editor, oh, it has to be done for this story, but everything in me wants to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I feel I feel like I'm back in the eighties and I'm about to start playing an Ozzy Osbourne album backwards. <laughs> so apparently, of course, you know, id Software has recently re released a new version of the old classic game Doom, which uh, I hear is actually pretty fun. I've not actually seen anybody play it, but I don't know. I, I got too many games now as it is. Yeah. So somebody... Uh, Tom Butcher, oh uh, yeah, intrepid fan Tom Butcher, noticed that at least one tune in the soundtrack, the tune titled Cyber Demon, shows both pentagrams and the number 666 when you visualize the mus music's frequencies through a spectrogram. He had time, didn't he? <laughs> well, I'm wondering, now, you know, Winamp, which was probably, for the longest time, the very best MP3 player, and it played Wave and all of that. And of course, now 
Uh, they don't work on it anymore because AOL bought the company and then eventually killed the dang thing. But, you know, yeah. v- VLC will pretty much play anything. I don't know if VLC's got a spectrograph or not, but uh, or a spectrogram. <clears throat> but I think that Winamp did at some point. So I'm wondering if that's if you could use that. I haven't tried it. Mm. So composer Mick Gordon recently teased that this hidden sinister imagery might be present in a video at the 329 mark, but there's no doubt about it. Clearly, he remembers the days when the original Doom's hellish artwork had some parents in a frenzy. Mm. <laughs> oh, and of course, I mean, you know, you're, you're fighting demons. Of course, you're well, going to yeah. have that specific thing. It's, it goes with it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's in fact the whole point of the thing, isn't it? That you're destroying all of these demons, not that you're becoming part of their rank or something. I mean, this this is another one of those cases, or at least the parent uproar in the original game and stuff is one of those cases where someone doesn't do their research. I've I always love whenever some, although. I say love in quotation marks with a little eye roll when some advocacy group, usually some Christian advocacy group, and I have to go, guys, quit doing this. Um, Say, this thing's evil. Why? (laughs) Well, because this, this, and this. Have you played it? No, but I know it. Stop right there. You just lost your ability to talk. Oh, or they decide they need to ban books. Yeah. I remember. I remember (laughs) whenever I was... uh, <clears throat> I was in high school, mm. and my girlfriend at the time, her her uh, father was a preacher, and there mm. was this big uproar at Fisher High School. Parents came together, and they wanted to ban certain books, and one of the books they wanted to ban was Vonnegut Slaughterhouse Five. Mm. I mean, I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you doing? I mean, this is. Yeah, maybe it's not the best book in the world. It's an interesting story. It makes your it makes the kids think, but it's it's not going to turn them into depraved, you know, sex hungering, murdering, <laughs> decapitating, cutting off right. limbs. I mean, no, it's not going to do that. You know, it, oh, I just I don't understand people sometimes. I really don't. I mean, I'm I'm a parent. I've been a parent for twenty going on twenty four years now, and I would never do anything idiotic like that. I mean, it's not like we just said, hey, here's the porn channel. Go for it. (laughs) Right. But, you know, we guided everything that they they, uh, were exposed to. But Mm -hmm. we did it in such a manner that we exposed them to certain things, and then we explained it to them. Yeah. Not not this typical, oh, well, here's a book. Figure out how how babies come to be. (laughs) Yeah. My parents were the same way, though. So. And I turned out just fine and adjusted, I hope. <laughs> Some people will, will argue that. I don't want to hear your letters. <laughs> um, but, but no, I mean, the, the latest version of that sort of thing um, is that we've been doing Dungeons & Dragons at the library for about a year now, right? Mm-hmm. And near the very beginning, there were these two kids. They still get to show up for other stuff. Um, but they started in the program, you know, because we had... We had been just doing game night, and then it sort of became an every other thing, and then it became its own program. It sort of evolved over time. Um, But then their mother found out that it was Dungeons & Dragons, and because it was works of Satan, they weren't allowed to come back anymore. Oh, wow. So, I mean, I... I'm going to have to bring this up sometime. I found an old pamphlet that showed all of the things that this one group swore you could become demon possessed because of I'm going to hell. That's if these, <laughs> if these people are right, I'm done. I'm, I'm destroyed. That's let me put it this way. I just, that's, just the stuff that was like, and some of the stuff was obvious, you know, like necromancy and stuff like that. Well, yeah, duh. Right. I don't see any problem with you saying that that's on the list, but like Lord of the Rings was on that list, <laughs> you know, and things like that. So it's it's a it's a beautiful list, and I've been meaning to do a bit on Samuel's thoughts about it for a while. I might end up bringing it here and us just having a good old time with that anytime we're having a slow day or something like that. Hey, what's wrong so, with necromancy? I got a few dead <laughs> bodies in my backyard. I go out and sprinkle some things occasionally and say some things in Latin and, and get infused with power. I mean, what's wrong with that? Uh, 
what was that? That lightning. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but no, it is yeah. kind. Of, it is kind of ri- ridiculous. I've seen those types of lists before too, and it mm-hmm. always gets me when they they add literature like Lord of the Rings and um, you know various. Uh, you know, Harry Potter. The uh, number of people that came out against Harry Potter. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> you just got bad taste. It's not like you're intelligent and trying to save your child from hell. You just got bad taste. You don't know what good writing they're, is. They're having problems separating fiction from reality is what's going on in that specific case. If it involves it at all, cut it off. Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah, that's true. To me... And I'll and I'll I'll say this and we'll move on. Mm. When you when a person does that and they do it under the guise of their faith, <laughs> then that tells me that their faith is very weak. <laughs> yep. Because if they had strong faith, wouldn't matter what was thrown at them. Teach your children right, you're gonna be on the side side of good or whatever. But when you gotta start Stepping in and removing all of these things that I don't know the rest of the world thinks is pretty okay, <laughs> uh, you got some problems. Your, your your faith is really weak or non-existent. You're making up for something. But anyway, mm-hmm. and you didn't read some stuff right. I'll put yeah. it. I'll put that bit in. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll give you that one too. You misunderstood some things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so this story is is tragic, um, and it's. It could have been more tragic, and I don't know which side of the equation you're going to come down on, but mm. um, we had the Cincinnati Zoo and the Botanical Garden. And Sunday, apparently they have this thing, um, Gorilla Land or Gorilla World or something like that. I forget how many are actually in there. But there was a 17-year-old Western lowland gorilla named uh, Harambi. I guess is how you pronounce it. It's H A R A M B E. Mm. <clears throat> anyway, there was this four four year old little boy. Number one, I have an issue with carrying a four year old child to a zoo, mm. especially if you're not going to put a leash on him. Yeah. Um, and for those who might go a leash, he's not <laughs> an animal. Send your hate mail because I'll tell you right now, my wife. I thought it was the most ridiculous thing whenever, you know, we had our children. And then I realized how smart it was. We had leashes for all three of our children. So Mm -hmm. whenever we were out in public, especially in large groups where she wanted to make sure that she could keep an eye on them, they all three had leashes on them. Mm -hmm. It was like a harness with a, you know, with a long leash. We knew exactly where our children were. And even without leashes, you can take care of your kids. I never had a leash, and but I had a verbal leash. If I got well, too yeah. far away, you found out real quick, and I got right back to them. <laughs> That's yeah. true. That's true. And I mean, you know, in my day and day and age, a leash would 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 have looked ridiculous because we didn't have to really worry about the things. Whenever I was my children's age, whenever we were doing this that we did once they got of this particular age, you know, kidnappings Mm -hmm. and things like that. And that's what this would help prevent. All right. So with all that said, if you're going to take your four-year-old child to the zoo, you better keep your hands on that youngin. Yeah. But instead, this child actually even told his mom that he was going to go get in the water, which I don't understand if, if he was going, if he told her that she should have been a little more aware of where he was. Should have looked down and went, you are not. Yeah, you are not. And if <laughs> you are you want, staying right here. And if you want to be able to sit down later this afternoon, <laughs> you're definitely not going to. Yeah. But anyway, so the child made it through the barrier, um, I guess fell down into the area with the gorilla. And the funny thing was, based on this article that I read from CNN, he went over there, the gorilla, he's 450 pounds now, which is scary as hell. But he mm-hmm. actually went over there and picked the boy up, pulled his pants back up like he was protecting him. And I think what happened was the crowd started making a lot of noise, which then got the gorilla agitated. Mm-hmm. And, of course, then he takes the child by the foot and starts dragging him through the water and everything. And when the child tries to get away from him, 
the, the, the gorilla is actually holding him, which I'm thinking probably trying to hold him to protect him right. from all of this noise that's happening around. Mm-hmm. And they claim that the child was in danger. Therefore, a, a trank wouldn't have acted quickly enough. So they killed the gorilla. Mm. The, um, there's been an online petition seeking justice for him through criminal charges. Uh, it earned more than 8,000 signatures in less than 24 hours. Now, <clears throat> here's how I come down on this. Mm. This woman, this mother of this child, is 100% responsible for the death of that gorilla. Mm. That along with the Cincinnati Zoo itself. Because the Cincinnati Zoo could have taken other action. This this is deadly force. They could have taken other action. Now, I understand there was a four-year-old child's life at stake, potentially. Mm -hmm. But you would think that the people that work at this zoo, these are supposed to be experts. They're supposed to know how to work around these animals. They're supposed to understand how these, the, the mindset of these animals. And I know things can, I mean, just crap can happen. But at the same time, I, I 100% believe this woman is responsible for the death of this gorilla. Mm. And that, yes, there should be some type of criminal charges brought against her. I'm now, not sure how legally you could do that, right? There's, there's well, going to be yeah. a lot of arguments involved. But ca- if you look purely at causality, as it were. Mm-hmm. See how many times you get to use that word in a conversation. I, I know, right? <laughs> but if you look at causality, then yes, her being a neglectful mother killed that gorilla. I mean, there's no there's no other way of looking at it, really. I wish there was some way. You know me. I always like to look at both sides of a situation and kind of figure things out. And And in this case, I'm just sad that this happened as a result. Um, but yeah, she she paid attention to her kid. None of this would have happened. So, yeah, I, mean, I agree. And I'm not saying that she's a bad parent. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not going to come out and say this woman is a bad parent. I don't know her. Yeah. Um. I I did find out, however, <clears throat> an ironic place that I found out was uh, off of Tom Likas's Facebook page. Mm-hmm. He uh, he actually posted that the woman actually works for like uh, Defacts, you know, the the child services. So, you know, that's a head scratcher. <laughs> this is a woman who is tasked with the uh, the welfare of children, not mm-hmm. just her own, but the welfare of children that, that need help. Right. And now she's in this situation where a little bit of neglect, she took her eye off the ball, if you will. Yeah. And of course, they say that for this child to get through that barrier was no easy feat. It's not right. like he just went zip, 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 I'm in, because if that were the case, that is a sucky barrier, and, and we would have already had situations like this in the past, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So it, it took some doing for the child to get through there, which makes me think, and this is all supposition on my part, this entire order, she she was not watching her child for several minutes mm. until everybody heard the splash and the child was down in the water. Yeah. So ultimately, my my opinion on this is, though you may not can charge her criminally, there should be some type of culpability that she has. She at least needs to, to have to come out and say, look, I made a mistake. I am really sorry. I apologize. It, it, it's, you know, I'm glad my child's OK. I should have mm-hmm. kept a better eye on him. And I'm really, really sad that this 17 year old gorilla has been put down. Um. I, I mean, I don't think there's any anything that you could fine her for or anything like that. But, you know, just admit to some wrongdoing, at least. And maybe, you know, Anonymous won't dox you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because if Tom Likas already knows who you are, and I'm not, <laughs> not going to say her name because I'm, I'm not that kind of person. But, right. <clears throat> you know, if Tom Likas can find you... Uh, mm-hmm. You have no no hope when it comes to anonymous. Yeah, totally. Okay, so remind me, have you seen Batman versus Superman? I have not. Okay, 
I'm probably going to wait for it to come out to DVD after everything I've heard. <laughs> All right, so. so the one you have seen is Captain America. Yes. Okay. All right, so Jeremy Irons, who actually plays Alfred in the Batman vs. Superman movie, has actually come out and stated that the movie deserved the bad reviews. Mm. He said that, he said, uh, I mean, it took in 800 million, and of course what he's saying here is 800 million pounds, so the kicking didn't matter, but it was sort of overstuffed. It was very muddled. And he even said that he thinks the next one will be simpler. The script is certainly a lot smaller, and it's more linear. And and, and Ben Affleck is in charge of it. I mean, the, he, he, Ben Affleck knows what he's doing. He, is, he has done this sort of thing in movies before, been in charge of a movie, and yeah. shown that he can totally do it. So it makes sense that it's a bit more... Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to necessarily make comments on specific directors and stuff like that, although the the director involved with this is quite infamous for doing crap like this all the time. Uh so I think yeah. I think Snyder is actually a pretty decent director though. Mm-hmm. For the most part, and of course, I have not seen Batman versus Superman yet, so it's it's kind of right. difficult. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. Um I'm the kind of guy that <clears throat> all of the crap that the critics gave Man of Steel. I honestly loved Man of Steel. To me, it's one of the very best Superman movies ever made. You and can... I haven't seen it either because I'm not a big Superman person. So yeah. I was going to watch Batman versus Superman because Batman. <laughs> but, uh, so you've never seen Man of Steel? <laughs> no, I haven't. Oh, you really should. You mm-hmm. really should. Because to me, it's a really good movie. Okay. And, and of course, you know, all, all you haters, email address is don at adkissing.co. Anyway, <laughs> or feedback at slant.fm. That works. Mm. I don't really care because I like the movie. <laughs> um, I recently watched the 2006 Superman Returns movie that's got, uh, oh God, his name just escaped me, but he plays uh, he plays Palmer, the, the Atom on Legends of Tomorrow and, and uh, what have you. Anyway, that was actually not a bad Superman movie either, but it, it kind of went off the rails. But Man of Steel, in my opinion, was it was the modern era Superman. Let's put it that way, in my opinion. Mm. So they've upped Ben Affleck, like you say, they kind of give him a little bit more control of the upcoming Justice League Part 1. Snyder is still directing it. But now Ben Affleck is... uh, Executive producing. Not Affleck, Affleck. Anyway, (laughs) he's executive producer. They've also put an official head over DC Films. So what they've done is they've tried to mimic what Marvel has done. Mm. So they're putting somebody in charge of DC Films to kind of coordinate everything. Um, They're scaling back the roles of those that have been intimately involved in the crafting of the DC Extended Universe thus far. So basically they kind of looked at it and said, okay, we got too many many chiefs in the kitchen, not enough Indians here. Mm. And uh, so they, they tried to to restructure to be more like Marvel. And of course, Ben is also going to, he's co-written and I believe he's going to direct the standalone Batman movie that's going to be coming up. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be a couple of years down the road. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of sad to me when, when you have a movie that was so highly anticipated like this one, Batman versus Superman, mm-hmm. and I always wondered about this anyway, whenever it was first announced that it was going to be Batman versus Superman, and I'm like, okay, I kind of get it because it really draws from the comic book, Batman versus Superman, right. the yep. animated uh, storyline or whatever, you know, which was pretty good. Uh, and then you start seeing all these reviews like it's complete crap and all this other kind of stuff, and I'm like, Really? Which, you know, when I start seeing that, I'm like, great! It means I'm going to absolutely love it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But we'll see, because I I won't be able to see it until it's available on digital download, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now, my my Bruce Wayne and Alfred are on television, as opposed to... (laughs) Really? (laughs) What? Gotham. Oh! God, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I don't know. For, I was thinking 1960s era Batman, and I'm like, really? <laughs> no. <laughs> I love the Adam West years because they were cheesy on purpose, well, though. It's not, it's not like they <clears throat> did that and, oh, this is horribly cheesy. It's like, I no, know. they intended it to be that. It was never, uh, it was never intended to be serious. I get right. that. Yeah, totally. Uh, but but no, yeah, Gotham right now is mm. what I'm... Oh, and they're doing so many good things with Gotham. I am loving it. <laughs> so you did finish up this season, right? Not yet. Oh, God. I've got like one episode left, I think. The right. last one? I think. Yeah, all right. One or two. I can't remember which. Yeah. Point is, I'm not that far away. <laughs> You're going to love it. Mm-hmm. You're gonna... Already, watching, already watching Penguin come into his own, just like, yeah! <laughs> yeah how far down did, have you gotten though i mean uh because i don't want to give anything away mm. eh, just never mind we will talk yeah. about it <laughs> we'll talk about it whenever i finish those two up right all right so uh x-men apocalypse dominated the memorial day weekend you're very happy about this in our movie draft. So. It's about time. I've been sitting at zero for the entire time. Of course, I don't know. Have our numbers been updated? Our, oh, crap. Come out of that. I forgot I was screen capturing that. I don't want everybody's name on there. Um, anyway, I'll look at it later. I don't know if the numbers have been updated yet. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let me flip over here and look real quick. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Refresh. Mojo. Oh, all right. Yes. <laughs> I'm in third place finally. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Our producer is at number one with 864 million. The Germans at 377 million. I'm at 114 million. You're at 96 million. And Sue is at 79. Mm. But I think this was the only good movie I had out of the whole damn thing. So mm-hmm. I tried. I tried so hard. But in the end, yes, it and then didn't I took even Warcraft and ripped you it did. out of your hot little hands. You <laughs> did. Man, I wanted to fight for that one, but I was like, mm. all right. So, uh, $65 million for the three-day weekend, projected $80 million for the entire four-day holiday. And, of course, you know, the numbers have already been updated. Of course, we also had uh, Alice Through the Looking Glass. Um, said it's lagging behind in second place with a disappointing estimate at $28.1 million for the three-day weekend. Has a yep. projection of $35.6. Uh, Angry Birds movie. Is set for third place with an estimated eighteen point seven million for the weekend, twenty four point five million for the four day count. In its second weekend, the animated film based on the popular video game series has seventy two million total in box office. Hmm. And of course, Disney's Captain America: Civil War is headed for fourth place with fifteen million for the three day, nineteen point four for the four day. It has earned three hundred seventy six point nine million in its fourth weekend, passing Deadpool. Three hundred and sixty two million to become the reigning box office champion of twenty sixteen. So yep. kind of cool. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm yeah, I had actually forgotten about that until you said it. And I was like, <laughs> Oh yeah, I need to look at those numbers. Yep. <laughs> oh <clears throat> okay. Asus, who is known for making computers and motherboards, has unveiled a robot called <laughs> Zenbo. It's adorable. He's a cute little thing. I mean, he's got a little winky face. Um, I watched part of the video that's at the bottom of this article. It's f- mm-hmm. 11 freaking minutes long. So, <laughs> you <laughs> right. know, go to the show notes once this is posted, find the link, and watch it yourself. But um, he's going to respond to voice commands, and he's going to be $599. Of course. <laughs> Which is not actually a bad price for something like that. Um, mm. But he can take photographs. They did a demonstration. Uh, the chairman, Johnny Shi demonstrated Zimbo at a press conference in Tapai. I guess that's how you say that. Anyway, he gave it voice commands and asked it questions as it rolled around the stage. He said, hey, Zimbo, is it true you can take pictures 
Yes, I can take photographs, the robot replied. So he told Zimbo to take his photo with the audience in the background. She positioned himself on stage, and Zimbo trottled over and took his picture. Said it was an impressive demonstration, assuming, I like this, <laughs> Zimbo wasn't being remotely controlled somehow from backstage. Gotta have that little bit of healthy skepticism in the tech press, don't we? <laughs> of course. So he can read stories, and they say they're not sure if he's quite as smart as Amazon Echo or Siri. Mm-hmm. Because they said it's tempting to think of Zimbo as an Amazon Echo or Siri on wheels. Hmm. Um, uh, she asked him, uh, hey, Zimbo, who is smarter, Leonardo da Vinci or Albert Einstein? And Zimbo responded, I'm sorry, I do not know the answer, but I will continue to work on my knowledge. Hmm. Don't worry, as soon as Skynet comes online, you'll, get, you'll have access to everything you need. <laughs> Either that or we have her, and it's been long enough, so spoiler alert still, but it's, it's been long enough. Either that or we have her, and then we have a bunch of just operating system-less robots that are just sitting there at the end. <laughs> yeah. That was a good movie. Yeah, but that end was a rip. I mean, it, it wasn't like it was a bad end. I'm just <clears throat> saying if I put myself in the position of a person that had bought that operating system, yeah. I'd be pissed. <laughs> well, yeah, because to me... It was almost like, you know, you develop this relationship with someone, you gotten really close, and then they're like, well, I'm moving to Russia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or it, except in this case, it's, I'm moving to Pluto. Mm -hmm. so. and, then he, and then you lose that friendship, and your phone doesn't work anymore. That's it's right. Like, <laughs> yeah, my phone, my computers, nothing wants to work anymore. <laughs> Oh, <clears throat> all right. So first we had Budweiser with America. Mm -hmm. Now we've got Coke this weekend unveiled their patriotic cans for Memorial Day. They've got red, white, and blue. And uh, it's a limited edition patriotic red, white, and blue cans. And it's to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Service Organizations. Mm. So Coke was a founding partner with the USO during World War II when American companies and entertainers set out to offer soldiers some homespun fun to help take their minds off the war. You know, I think that's actually like Bob Hope and a lot of those folks had a, mm. uh, went over there a lot of times and, and did stuff. USO, like I think you're right. I think Bob Hope and them were part of that. Yeah. They also plan to kick off uh, it's Share a Coke and a Song campaign at this weekend's Coca-Cola 600 NASCAR race, which apparently has already happened, considering today is Monday. Right. Mm. So USO Chairman and Retired General George W. Casey will serve as the Grand Marshal of the Coca-Cola 600 as the sponsor's guest, and the company said 6,000 service members will be in attendance at the Charlotte Motor Speedway for the race. Nice. Cool. Honestly, I wouldn't mind getting my hands on some of those just to have to. I've got an old Budweiser can, um, and and you're you may be young enough that you never actually, other than, well, you've never would have purchased this type of can, but it had the pull right. tab. Mm. So this is an old Budweiser, still full of beer, still has the beer in it now. Found mm. it in the top of a dentist's office in the attic. <laughs> Was doing some running some cable and found it up there. I guess a, whenever they were building the building, the workers, you know, kicked back, had a six pack or something. One of them got loose. Right. So I've had this thing since about 93 or 94. It's up in uh, one of my cabinets. Nice. But it's a Budweiser fully, fu still with the beer. I wouldn't drink it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's got the pull tab. So, yeah, I wouldn't mind having, you know, some of these for, and I'd, I'd want them full. I wouldn't want just the can. I'd want them full. So 20 or 30 years from now, I'd be like, why the hell do I still have these things? <laughs> okay. Uh, some more techie stuff. Um, I think this is a little unfair, but... All right, so right now, you probably know that if you have an Android phone well you may not because you don't have a smartphone but if you have an android phone 
you can have your pictures automatically backed up to the cloud with mm. Google. Because, you know, an Android phone, but you basically log in with a Google account and it syncs everything as, as, as much as it can. They have similar options with the Google apps on iOS and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So. so your photos get uploaded, but you, if you want your photos to upload in the very best quality, then it's not free. You actually have mm -hmm. to pay for space or whatever if you run out. If you want it to upload at a reduced quality, which is still a pretty good quality, then it's there for free. Now what Google is doing is if you have a Nexus smartphone, and this is only going to be on the, the Nexus smartphones, right? you get unlimited original quality backup storage for free. Yeah. So if Interesting. You, if you're using any other any other Android phone, you won't get that capability. Mm. It says, right now, as of today, the free storage of Google can, can support photos up to 16 megapixel and videos up to 1080p. This clearly says Android device owners will not be able to up upload 4K videos. With the upcoming Google Photos version 1.21, Nexus users will be able to save 4K videos as well. Not to forget, most high-end devices nowadays come with support for 4K video recording. And so this news has been... I, hey, thank you. I love how it just jumps all over the place while it's trying to... It's, <laughs> the flash plug-in failed to load, so it's it's nutting up is what it's doing. It's, <laughs> it's bust, busting a nut anyway. <laughs> Pre-show talk. <laughs> <sighs> all right, so... Uh, Oh, gone it. Where was I? Okay, yeah, it's been confirmed based on the APK teardown done by Android police. Mm. But Google itself has not confirmed it. Mm. So we'll see. We shall see. All right, another little techie thing. This one will probably uh, most people won't care, but you know, there actually is a path limitation in Windows as far as like when you like C colon backslash, folder backslash, folder backslash, folder backslash. Mm -hmm. It actually right now has a 260 character path limit. But when Windows 10 build 14.352, which is a preview version of the upcoming anniversary update, also known as Redstone. <laughs> I'll, I'll get into why I find that funny in a bit. Go I know. On. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> um, they're going to change that to, I think it's going to be uh, unlimited. Mm. Yeah. And the benefit of that is it will allow you to run operations with files regardless of their path or file name. Um, because Tyler's actually run into s some problems with that whenever we would have some files that were like deeply nested down in there. And, and not only that, but, you know, back in the old DOS days, it was 8.3. You had eight characters and then you had a three character extension. Mm. And I think Macintosh was the first operating system, other than any kind of Linux variation, that you could just basically name a file, you know, whatever you wanted to. It didn't have to be a short name, like eight characters in a three-character extension. Mm. So you, if you got long file names, you could actually have a problem where you go past <coughs> that 260-character limit. And I know in some, some file recovery things that Tyler's had to do in the past, he's had to work around that. Mm. So, um, looks like in Windows 10, Redstone, the anniversary update, they're they're finally going to fix that. I mean, it's only been 20 years, <laughs> <laughs> so about time. But, uh, yeah, Redstone. Of course, I'm finding it funny because Microsoft buys <laughs> Minecraft and then names their next update to their operating system Redstone. Redstone. So. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. I will say that this is something that, uh, <clears throat> not today, but I'm a little ashamed that I had to get a little bit of education on this a couple of years ago, too. Mm. Um, the difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Mm. And it gets confusing because you'll see a lot of people that will will say, you know, shout out or, or uh, happy Memorial Day, which you shouldn't say, but, uh, you know, for all of, all of our men and women in the armed services. Well, Memorial Day is not for the living. Right. 
Memorial Day is to reflect and remember those who have died in battle yeah. or as a result of wounds sustained in battle. Whereas Veterans Day is actually set aside to thank and honor all of those who have served honorably in the military, whether mm-hmm. it's in wartime or peacetime. So that's the biggest difference right there is the fact that Memorial Day is for those who have perished during wartime. You know, this is the day to remember those people that died in World War I, World War II, the Civil War, the Korean mm-hmm. War, Vietnam War, all of those folks. Then when we have Veterans Day, that is when we acknowledge and thank everybody that serves their country in the armed forces. So that's the biggest difference between the two. Yep. Uh, We've already kind of touched base on this, but Captain America Civil War has toppled Deadpool to become the highest grossing film in North America for 2016. And that and that picture on that article, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? And, and the slash writers go crazy. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> Uh, yep. For anyone that's listening in audio, it's a picture of Robert Downey Jr. kissing Chris Evans on the cheek. Yep. So <laughs> that is true. And of course, him standing there happily smiling while it happens. <laughs> it says while Deadpool may have relinquished the top spot with a total gross earnings of three hundred and sixty two point eight million from more than thirty eight hundred cinemas, it is still in second place and does still hold the distinction of being the highest-grossing film in the X-Men franchise in the (laughs) world and the highest-grossing R-rated movie in the land. Yep. In terms of the international box office, Captain America Civil War has crossed the $1 billion mark, while Deadpool has logged $736 million. But there's still a chance for the Merc with a mouth to shorten the gap, because the movie hasn't opened in Japan yet. It will two days from now. Interesting. June 1st, which is Wednesday, I believe, because tomorrow's the 31st. Yeah. And, of course, Deadpool 2 has been greenlit. And, of course, we're going to see the entire team come back, which is good. So I'm looking forward to that. I, I have to say, and I've said, I've said it before and I'll say it again, Deadpool, to me, has been the very best I rank it right there, number one, very best Marvel movie ever produced. I still have to see it. It's it's on the list. <laughs> I give it my number one spot, and then I give Guardians of the Galaxy my number two spot. Iron Man 1 is my number three spot. Avengers, the first Avengers movie, is number four. And then it just kind of peters out from there. Mm. The worst one out of all of them, Iron Man 2. Mm. That one was terrible. <laughs> Whiplash. It was terrible. <laughs> yeah. Just absolutely terrible. Mm. All right, this is a story our producer threw in. A man accused of driving through a Memorial Day cross display. Hey, that's up there in your neck of the woods. <laughs> 27-year-old man is accused of trashing a Memorial Day cross display in Henderson, Kentucky over the weekend. How far, how far away is Henderson from you? I definitely know the area. I don't think that's too far away from here. I can't give you exact mm-hmm. minutes, but I don't think it's that too far away, actually. So Anthony Burris allegedly drove a Ford Thunderbird through a field of white plastic crosses set up inside the city's Central Park to honor more than 5,000 residents who died while serving their country. Witnesses called police to the scene shortly after 6 a.m. on Saturday. Upon arrival, they found 160 damaged crosses. Now, this is what gets me, and me and the producer were talking about this earlier today. Each one of those crosses is valued at $100 each. Mm. Those crosses do not cost $100 to produce. (laughs) Those crosses are plastic, they are injection molded, and they probably were less than a buck easy to produce. Hey, it's business. What? <laughs> yeah. I'm, having been in the plastic extrusion business for <laughs> almost four years total, yeah. 
We didn't do injection molding, but I know I know how things are made, and I know how they're sold, and they're sold by weight. And uh, those plastic crosses won't weigh that much, and yeah, they're not worth a hundred dollars each. Yeah. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, this is about four hours away from me, by the way. Thank you, Google Maps. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, man, if we could have gotten this article a little earlier, you needed you could have been the the man on the the street, done some reporting. <laughs> I probably would have gotten the directions wrong and taken a wrong <laughs> turn. <laughs> I knew I should have taken that ride in Albuquerque. <laughs> Albuquerque, you're not anywhere near Albuquerque. That's part of my problem right mm-hmm. there. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> oh, so the volunteers from the Henderson Fire Department and the American Legion banded together. They restored 140 of the crosses to their rightful places. Um, the police department actually took to Facebook on Saturday to issue a series of appeals for information about the incident because they didn't know who did it at the time. They eventually found the guy. His uh, vehicle was abandoned outside a McDonald's restaurant. Of course. <laughs> Pieces of the cross and stakes were found embedded in the tires, and he said, I didn't do it. <laughs> he said he didn't do it. He admitted to driving the vehicle in the morning, but would not state that he drove through the park. <laughs> but the evidence is in his car tires. <laughs> Mr. Burris, is this your 1970s whatever it is, Thunderbird? Yes, sir. So you admit that you own this car? Yes, sir. <laughs> those are your those are the tires that you've had on this car for however long you've owned this car. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Were you anywhere close to the <laughs> the park <laughs> at six o'clock Saturday morning? Yes, sir. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. All right, last story. And mm-hmm. I, got a, I got a sound clip for this one. It's, it's a lovely sound clip, too, because I ended up watching the video. I assume that's what you sound yeah, clipped, right? I yeah. did, the whole thing. It's about four minutes long. Um, mm-hmm. So, of course, this is Kit Harrington. Uh, for those who don't know who he is, then shame on you, because that means you've never watched Game of Thrones. Um, I, I've never watched Game of Thrones and I still knew who he was. Of course. So. He plays Jon Snow. You know, you know nothing, Jon Snow. If you don't know who he is, then you know nothing about Jon Snow. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So he was doing a radio interview on uh, BBC Radio One. Mm. And uh, let me cue that up and here we go. So Kit Harrington joins us today. Good morning. Good morning. But you did manage very convincingly, we thought. But you are an actor. Um, Lie to the nation, pretending that you didn't know if Jon Snow was coming back. You like didn't know what was going on with Game of Thrones when you were on Jonathan Ross. And we played this in the studio before, and Fifi was like, "He's he's good at lying." I was like, "Well, he is. (laughs) He's an actor by trade. (laughs) That's literally what he gets paid to do." Yeah. Um, But this is some real convincing line on Jonathan Ross. I am no longer involved in the show. Oh, yeah. So any secrets that are with the show, I don't actually know anymore. <laughs> this is, this, so it becomes very easy, Jonathan. Yeah. So you're looking at me like you don't believe me. This is gonna be, it's going to be so relieving when people actually see the show and realise that I don't come back. I'm bang to rights. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that is, that is. You big fat liar. Yeah, you big fat liar. Listen, I avoided all press for as long as I could. I said, I'm not, okay, I'm not going to do any press for a whole year. Uh-huh. I'm going to stay away and not say anything so I don't slip up, so I don't have to outwardly lie. Um, and eventually, you know, you're involved in something where you have to do press to promote uh-huh. the show. And, um, and I thought, who more would I want to lie to than Jonathan Ross? <laughs> <laughs> would you lie to Norton? Never lie to Norton. You can't lie to Norton. You can't lie to Norton. Norton. You can't lie to Norton. It's like lying to your grandma. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get on the phone. Probably one of your biggest fans in the world. Wow. Um, so they're on line one right now. Hello, who is that on line one? I'm here. It's Maisie Williams. I'm so excited. Oh, oh, Maisie! Oh, look who it is. <laughs> morning. Good morning, morning, Maisie. How are you guys doing? I've been listening in. <laughs> How do you think it's going, Maisie? 
How am I doing, doing mate? very well. I'm really gutted that I didn't get to come and see you, Dr. Faustus, the other day. I'm very sorry. I got an ear infection. She bailed on me. Oh, did she? That's I what sorted, I told you, I anyway. sorted the tickets out and everything, and she bailed. Wow. Oh, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. I mean, come on, you're, you've been working with Kit for years, and you can't support him now that he's, you know, in a play. Come on. No, I just thought that we were such good friends that he would understand, but clearly I've misjudged this whole relationship. I Jeez. do. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Maze? Where are you? Are you? Are you at home? I am. I'm at home. I just got back from... I, w- I went to the gym this morning and on the radio, it was like, we're going to have Kit Harrington here. And I was like, no, I'm going to miss it. And then I got back from the gym and here you are on the radio. <laughs> and now you're still... on. And I'm on too. Hogging it all. Uh, I, I wanted... To, I did actually have a question though. I did have a question. What is, what is, what is it, what is it, Maisie it, Williams? How can I... When we're next hanging out, Kit? Well, you tell me. Do you want to come see the play? Yes, I would, and I'd like to actually come this time. Come with Soph? You're going to come with Soph? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Do it, well, can we do it on a night where you've got a night off and we'll all go out and party afterwards? Come on a Thursday night and then we can... Thursday no, actually, night. Thursday or a Saturday. I love this, just having a chat with me. This is just admin. This, this is just live <laughs> admin. This just, this just saves me from all the texts we were doing. <laughs> um, come on a Thursday or a Saturday night and then we'll go out after. All right, I will message Sophie immediately and we'll Brilliant. sort it out. Brilliant. Great. I'll sort tickets. Thank you. Thank awesome. you very much, Kit. Now, I'll speak to you soon. <laughs> now, wait, wait, no, you're not going just yet, Maisie. I have another question, oh, okay. because that was literally just admin. <laughs> you literally just you literally just called Radio 1 to get another set of free tickets to your Kit's play. Um, yeah. So it's going to be Kit and Sophie and Maisie. You're all going to go and see the play and then go and have a night out. Yeah, we are indeed. So everyone has to come down on either a Thursday or a Saturday and hope that they see us all three there together. <laughs> all three there together. I was going to say, that will blow. If someone's going along to this play and they're like, we've been dragged along, they're like, oh, I wish I was at home watching Game of Thrones. And then they get there and they got their mind is going to explode. <laughs> yeah, it would be quite a night for those people. Has that happened where you three have hung out and people have like been in a restaurant and been like, oh, my, it was literally cast a Game of Thrones in here? Yeah. It happens with me and Sophie, yeah. Yeah, it happens quite a lot. I, I think whenever you're with one other person of Thrones or two other people, <laughs> if there's any doubt in anyone's head that it's you, it's smashed by the fact that I'm with Samuel Tarly. You know? yeah. <laughs> and then you've got no hope. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, wow, it's yeah. really that. Do you think he will end up on the Iron Throne as king? Yes. <laughs> That's confirmed. Um, Kit, thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs> Shout out to Nick Grimshaw for taking care of that situation. This, there were several bits and bobs inside of that interview, that little clip that just made me happy that even have nothing to do with Game of Thrones. Like, would you, well, of course I'd want to lie to Jonathan Ross, but would you lie to Graham Norton? No, that's like lying to your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> He is. He's so adorable and so sweet. You couldn't lie to Graham Norton. You kidding me? <laughs> Plus, he plus once he found out, he turned it into a bit in about five seconds. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I love that last little bit though. Are Are you going to be sitting on the Iron Throne? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, I could see Fingers it crossed. actually. <laughs> I could see it. Um, we Lee and I both have always wondered that. I mean, if you look at the fact that the 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 books are uh, the Song of Fire and Ice, so. We've got Daenerys Targaryen, who's got the dragons, and then we've got the White Walkers and and Jon Snow by his by the by his last name of being a bastard born brings in the whole ice element. Mm. So, and of course, there's been all kinds of theories out there that he's actually a Targaryen and all this other kind of stuff, which that'd be cool too. Mm. But we we just don't know. But anyway. I, I really enjoyed. Hey, I like him as an actor. He was in. He was in a movie, uh, the Seventh Son. He was short lived in the movie, um, and it was a movie that starred <sighs> Seventh Son cast. Jeff Bridges. Had Jeff Bridges, Julianne Moore, because Julianne Moore played the bad bitch in it. <laughs> uh, ben Barnes, uh, Alicia Vikander. Oh, really? She was in it, and Kit Harrington. And uh, it what it was is it was a movie about. Well, why don't I look it up and I'll read the scenario? Mm-hmm. 
it was one of these movies that actually they ran into all kinds of problems with it. They'd actually it actually been filmed and ready to go like a year and a half before it was ever released. Uh, but when Mother Malkin, the queen of evil witches, escapes the pit she was imprisoned in by professional monster hunter Spook decades ago, and that was played that was Jeff Bridges' character, and kills his apprentice, which is Kit. <laughs> That's the reason why I said he doesn't last very long. He yeah. recruits young Tom, the seventh son of the seventh son, to help him. Mm. So, anyway, well, I guess that's going to wrap it up. I will. Yep that was a that was a boatload of stories. Yeah, it was a packed show today. <laughs> who in the hell put all those in there? <laughs> hmm. I wonder who. <laughs> Oh, anyway, Sam, uh, where can you be found? What are you up to? What are you doing when you're not here doing this? Well, if you want to find all my other podcasts and other content that I make when I'm not here, you can go to tscn.tv. And if you want to help with that financially, given some value for value back, you can go to tscn.tv slash support. And all of my social media links and stuff like that can be found at about.me slash labtech7. Good deal. Yes. Go over there. Click. Click that support. Give it, give, give dollars, not cents, but dollars. Good content. Mm-hmm. All right. All my stuff is over at slant.fm. All my social media can be found at about, a bat, a bat dot, about, mm-hmm. a boot, about dot me slash GD ad Uh If you have any feedback, that email address is feedback at slant.fm. If you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 313 718 2557. Yes, 313. 313- 718-2557. It is different than a call-in number. Remember, we record this show live each Monday and Wednesday at 6 p.m. Have a great week. We'll see you next time for another episode of Watts. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. show is a production of the Slant FM Digital Network. Find more at slant.fm.